Hi, Clutter Fairy fans. This is the Clutter Fairy Weekly for July 26th, 2022. I'm your co-host, Ed Gumnick, and I'm speaking with Gail Goddard, certified professional organizer and owner of the Clutter Fairy in Houston, Texas. Hi, everybody. The Clutter Fairy Weekly is the webcast and podcast that digs deep into the clutter that piles up between you and the life that you want to be living. We explore the habits and behaviors that lead to clutter, and we suggest strategies to slow the accumulation, reduce the collection, and comfortably manage the stuff we decide to keep. If you're new to our Zoom meeting, we want to let you know that you can share your comments and questions via the chat feature, and I'll try to make sure Gail addresses them before we move on to another topic. You can also use the raise hand feature to ask a question or make a comment yourself via audio or video. Although I must say that we have sort of suffered from an embarrassment of riches in that regard recently. <laughs> so I don't want to discourage anyone from chiming in, but we have a lot to cover today. And so we may kind of try to hold your comments and questions till toward the end, so, till we make sure we get to everything we wanted to talk about. <laughs> so let's get right to it. Oh, I didn't say we're also streaming live on Facebook, so you can share questions and comments there as well, and I relay them to Gail. Let's talk about last week's tittle, which was called a product problem. The assignment was to review the bathroom products you've accumulated and thin the herd, as we like to say. We'd love to hear from our participants live in Zoom and on Facebook. Who found some bathroom products ready to dispose of or donate this week? Please let us know in the comments. YouTube viewer Melanie shared a great suggestion. This, this was not a, really a tittle report, just a terrific suggestion for the bathroom, which was to help you get an idea of how much of something you stockpile. When you start using it, write the date on the package or bottle. Then you'll know how long it takes you to use it, which will help you determine how much you want to keep on hand. And I thought that was such an excellent suggestion, Melanie. I mean, people do that with food in the refrigerator or things in the freezer, right? Why not do it with the products that you use in the bathroom? How great to say, oh, I started this bottle in January and now it's August and I'm just now running out. So it's a perfect way to see exactly how long that stupid bottle of shampoo lasts. And then you can calculate how many years worth of shampoo you have in the house. I'm going to guess that you'll be quite shocked by the years of stockpile you have. And maybe if you realize that you have enough shampoo to last the family until, oh, you know, 2045, you can probably let some of it go for now and, and not have as big of a collection and feel more comfortable if you only have, you know, two bottles of shampoo in the, the closet because that is actually a three year supply. So, <laughs> Uh, just to, it, it's, I think it's a great way to make the length of time it takes to use a product up so very obvious with that date on there and love it. And I think it's a great idea. It'll help everybody to do that, I think. Here's a wonderful comment from Leslie. It's not an answer to the tittle, but it's a really nice comment. I just have to say a giant thank you to both of you. I did it. I successfully downsized from 1,200 square feet to 200 square feet. And I was able to keep everything I really wanted wow. and it all fit in my trailer. Step one of my cross-country move is complete. I've listened to nearly every video on YouTube while I'm at work and while I was decluttering. You may remember me because I was working on the garage in the spring because I didn't <laughs> want to have to tackle it in Houston in July. Right? No kidding. Wow. I can't believe you went from 1,200 to 200. Congratulations. That's You have to have gotten rid of 80% of what you owned. That's super amazing. We're all um, cheering for you. Yay. That was a big deal. Wow. Diane, Diane was a week behind. She said, hello, all. I know I'm a little behind on topic, but decluttered and organized under the kitchen sink. Yay. Such small things make me happy. Right. It's a small encapsulated project that you can get to and declutter. And then when you open it up and look at it, it's like, well, this looks so much better. This works so much better. It's it's crazy the little things that uh, make you feel better, but that's one of them. It's like you get a little, make a little kitchen sink area look cleaner, and then it makes you happy every time you open it to pull out something. Good for you. Naomi had to report a step in the wrong direction. She says, uh -oh. did an anti-tittle, <laughs> found a tube of sunscreen in my bag, and I have no idea where it came from. I vaguely think I agreed to carry it for someone I was out with, but now I have one more instead of one less. 
<laughs> We've never had anybody report an anti tittle before. That's good. I like it. <laughs> well, so you have an extra sunscreen and you may want to, you know, see how old it is. Um, I think sunscreen in particular, like there's so much chemical action going on in the sunscreen. I don't really trust those chemicals after a you know, long period of time. So depending on how old it is, you may want to, you know, test it on your skin somewhere and see if your skin is okay with it. It doesn't react to it because it's old. Um, I've had some where I've like put sunscreen on my face and then gone out in the sun. And then it felt like I was having my skin burned off because the stuff was old and it reacted to the sunlight and just made a big mess. So I think some of them, it seems like they get a little, they get sort of clumpy. So even without testing on your skin, if you just, you know, squeeze the tube a little bit and then squeeze some out. And if the consistency isn't even, pitch it. Yeah, let it go, right? Because it's going to do that on your skin as well. Yeah, clumpy, Penny, clumpy is bad. Penny said, got rid of a bunch of excess stuff in the bathroom cabinets. Yay! That's always exciting, isn't it? And I know Penny has a smaller bathroom with a lot, of, not a lot of storage. So I'm sure that that relieves some uh, congestion for her. So thank you. Glad you did it. And Anita said, even after decluttering under the sink and discarding slash donating, I still have so many skincare products that I never have to buy any for years. Yeah. And remind yourself when you're standing in the makeup aisle at the grocery store or the, you know, makeup counter at the fancy makeup store that you can't possibly justify adding one more thing to your collection. I want you to have that vision in your head of how much there is. And when you find yourself shopping for makeup, you need to slap yourself on the hand. And Lee, <laughs> Lee said, tossed out a skin cleanser that I had an allergic reaction to and really don't know why I was keeping it. Oh, yeah, that needs to go. Well, probably because it was a, the bottle probably cost an exorbitant amount of money and it makes you sad to throw it away. But if you're going to have an allergic response to it, there's no absolutely like that money's just wasted. It needs to go. Yeah, unless there's someone else in your house who can use it. Right. Or, you know, you want to give it away to someone else and yeah. let them try it. Sophia asked, what's a tittle? And and Sophia, I'm assuming, is fairly new to, new to our webcast. Welcome. It's a, we give a little small weekly assignment at the end of each show, and we call it the weekly tittle, and we post it on our website the day after the, 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 the meetup so that you can uh, – you can – just make a little progress in an area usually related to what we talked about this week. It's almost yeah, we, always related to the topic. We reserve we the right to make it unrelated if we feel like it. <laughs> if we have a moment of uh, lack of inspiration. <laughs> right. Yes. We want to go some, some other urgent thing is bugging us and we want to get, get to talk about that instead. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay, we do have so much to talk about, so let's get right to the main topic. Okay. When your main clothes closet is stuffed to capacity, every day starts with an archaeological expedition in search of something to wear. But a trimmed down, organized closet can make getting dressed a delightful act of self-expression. Today, we're going to excavate the clutter issues in clothes closets and offer tips for organizing your wardrobe to support your style and lifestyle. First, let's take a look at a few statistical findings from the survey that everyone so kindly populated for us. We love that you guys are participating in the surveys. 74% of the respondents reported experiencing clutter in their main closed closet, and nearly 90% of those reported that it was a chronic problem, and more than 20% checks the box for my closet is a clutter disaster. Yeah, we clearly need a, a lot of help in this area. Right. We also asked about overflow clothing storage, and 74% of the respondents said that they store clothes in one or more areas besides the main closet. And of those, nearly 70% reported a, a chronic clutter problem in the overflow area as well. So our conclusion from the survey is that our viewers and listeners are really struggling with clothing storage. The closet's a space that can get out of control so fast and it can be hard to maintain it in good condition, but we're going to give you some help today, hopefully. So what does the closed closet clutter look like for the clutter-free audience? Here are some of the answers to our question about what items people keep an excessive number of. The first one was kids' clothes I can't seem to part with. 
that's a whole mommy and kid clothing discussion we get to have <laughs> 25 or more purses for all you you know purse junkies out there 11 pairs of black pants or jeans that was a big one like how many black pants can you have right 40 to 50 bandanas now bandanas are small squares of fabric and i get it that they don't take up a lot of room but 50 bandanas seems like a lot <laughs> like that's one a week for a year so i'm not sure how that like and this person also reported they're using them in specific, like they gave a list of the uh, the various ways that they use bandanas in their life. And so it's okay. Like clearly she's using bandanas way more than me, but I would still want to have a longer discussion about is 50 really necessary and, and maybe talk about thinning that out. Um, the last one is uh, 15 leather handbags, none of designer quality of which I use one. <laughs> so she has 15 purses. And she's using one of them. And that to me is like, okay, so you are you have 14 backups just in case. I'm pretty sure you don't need that many backups, right? So um, that's a leather handbag collection that isn't helping anybody at this point. And, and purses are annoying to store and they take up a lot of room and you have to like bin them, box them. You have to line them up like soldiers on the shelf with things in between them. And they're a, a management hassle in the closet. And so- Anybody that keeps a whole bunch of handbags has a storage problem just by the nature of handbags. That was only a, that little list that you just did was just uh, a the, tip, the tip of the iceberg yeah, of yeah, what yeah, people yeah. told us about ex ex excess things they keep. Right, exactly. And therein lies the issue for closet clutter. For, for most of us, the closet is a small, finite box, and it's not big enough to house big collections of anything. Walk-in closets are great, but you can still only have so many linear feet of clothing rods to hang on. Like there's only so much rod in there. Your closet is not a store. It can't hold what a store does. And I've been in houses with closets that are separate rooms with custom installed closet systems that are all fancy they have matching hangers and there's storage for all the shoes, et cetera. It's still just a big room with clothes you're not wearing. It's a lot of real estate given over to storing what in essence is a collection, just like sets of China or Star Wars action figures. Collecting that excess has negative consequences. And what are they? What are the negative impacts of closet clutter? Time and energy are big ones. They're wasted on trying to get to things that you know you have, but you can't find. You're getting dressed and it's taking longer than it should. You're tracking down clothes and finding things at the last moment that they finding out at the last moment you need to iron things and you can try to deal with, I can't find the clothes and then I have to iron them when I do find them. It's going to make you late to work or make you late to miss appointments. The condition of clothes suffers when the clothes can't hang free or be stacked comfortably or get any ventilation. The accumulation of dust and mildew and deterioration is worsened by that cramped conditions in the closet. Several respondents reported overspending because they're rebuying items they've forgotten that they already have, or they love black pants. And so they ignore the fact that they have several black pants and they see another black pant and they buy it anyway, even though they clearly have no need for it in the moment mess that spills out into the rest of the bedroom or elsewhere in the house you see that a lot and it's like at some point the closet is full and then it's full up to the doorway and then stuff starts getting stacked outside of the doorway and then the access gets farther and farther away from the door because the piles start you know it's like snow that's falling in the door into the bedroom it just sort of rolls out into Close your room drifts. yeah it just makes drifts everywhere right and then you try to solve that problem by taking over the next closet and the next closet and the next closet but the truth is you run out of closets at some point and then can you imagine getting dressed out of four closets no you just go out of, in and out of one closet or if it gets bad enough then you get dressed out of the laundry hamper because you can't put anything away. And then really, what have you, what have you, why are you saving it? What is the point? If you're getting dressed out of the laundry hamper because your clothes and closets are so out of control, then what really is the point of having all those clothes? What is the point? That mess has taken over and you can't use it. 
We feel lots of negative emotions when we confront those closets. All of these came up in your answers. Stress, shame, annoyance, overwhelm, aggravation, frustration, negativity around weight changes was a big one. Claustrophobia, confusion, sadness, guilt, panic, dread. This relatively small part of our lives takes a huge emotional toll. That list were all, all of those feelings. You guys reported all those feelings and being in your closet. And how is that a good thing? How is having all of your options and keeping all those clothes good for you if this list of you know 17 negative emotions is coming up because you have them that's that's so not logical to me one respondent said a cluttered closet equals a cluttered mind i can't think of what to wear or waste time looking for certain items yeah another favorite quotation came from glenna who shared i feel shame and embarrassment i keep wearing the same outfits instead of nicer options in my closet it starts the day with an out of control feeling. Well, that can't feel good. That is not, who wants to feel out of control as you start your day? <laughs> That's a way to torpedo the day right out of the chute, right? And if you're wearing the same outfits over and over, I mean, that's a version of I'm getting dressed out of the laundry hamper, right? She's wearing the same outfits because she can access them and she knows where they are. And the nicer options are buried in the closet somewhere. We did actually hear you know, I don't, I don't open my closet. I get dressed out of the clean, clean laundry hamper or pile. We and heard I've that heard that several times in those survey responses. And I've heard it over the years. I mean, I've been in the houses where the, the, the hamper of clean clothes is sitting there and the closet is stuffed to capacity and they haven't been in it for two years. And it's like, what is the point of that then? Well, how is that helping anybody? For our question about where your closet clutter originates, most of the responses clustered around a few main themes. The causes that came up most were, I'm keeping too much for the space I have available. Of course, this isn't a big surprise. It's almost the definition of a cluttered closet that there's so much in there that your closet isn't supporting the, need that you, the needs that you need it to serve. There's many variations on um, my weight fluctuates. I keep things that I hope to be able to wear again. I keep several sizes. Um, I spent a lot of money on these clothes, so it's hard to let them go. I hear that a lot. Um, my purging doesn't keep pace with my shopping. Shopping more quickly than you delete items inevitably, inevitably leads to clutter. Keeping clothes for multiple seasons, of course. Too much stuff in the closet that ought to be somewhere else. Now that's interesting. Like the closet is really for your um, clothes and shoes. And yet we put a whole bunch of other stuff in the closet as well. And so sometimes you're surrendering too much space in the clothing closet to things that don't really belong there. Sometimes the, the causes even pile up on top of each other. Diana shared this response. I bought clothes to inspire or encourage a weight loss program and then didn't want to waste the money by getting rid of them. So she added clothes that she couldn't wear. And then she didn't want to get rid of them because um, she'd spent money on them. So she sort of compounded her clothes problem by buying clothes in advance and being able to wear them. Um, another response was, I feel a sentimental attachment to certain things. And we do develop strong feelings of attachment to clothes that we've come to identify with. They become part of how we see ourselves, see ourselves. On the topic of sentimentality, we also asked a couple of questions this week designed to get to the meanings that we attach to clothes. Those questions were, what does it mean to you to save more clothes than comfortably fit in your main closet? And why do you want to keep so much? And we got a lot of fascinating answers to this, these two questions, and we want to unpack a few of them in some detail. This is, I think, where the rubber meets the road <laughs> in general around closets. Quite a few people answer with some variation of, I don't know. I don't know. So that's okay. We hope that our discussion today will help you think more deeply about what you're keeping and why, and that reflecting on what your collection means will empower you to understand your behavior more clearly and make decisions more readily. So let's listen to this response we received from Harley Jane. She says, I love wearing my clothes and love picking the exact right thing. Style-wise, color-wise, weather-wise, and mood-wise. 
which requires a lot of clothes. And throwing out my sentimental favorites is very hard for me. The red ski jacket I bought in 1984 that reminds me of my late lamented mom and Christmas at her house on the lake. I'm still wearing it just to justify its presence in my closet. This response was so fascinating to me. While I endorse saving a few items as keepsakes, I also believe you can't make the closet an archive of the clothes I have known and loved. <laughs> the clothes I have known and loved. <laughs> you need that closet to house what you're currently wearing for the most part. So if the almost 40 year old ski jacket is that important, it's a worthy keepsake. But if you have 150 keepsake items of clothing, then you're surrendering too much space to the memory of clothes stored in the place where your current clothes need to be. I know that there's always clothes that people feel like they're keeping as keepsakes. And, and really the twist there is, is the major, is there a, a big collection, a big portion of the clothes in your closet that are keepsakes then you are surrendering, you're changing your closet from a functional use space to a storage space. And if you only have one closet, or this is the closet that's in the master bedroom where you need to get dressed, getting dressed in a storage unit is a lot, a lot harder than getting dressed in a, in a functional working closet. So we all have keepsakes and we all want to keep some, but that really needs to be 5%, 10%. It needs to be a few items. It doesn't need to be half the stuff in your closet. Another respondent shared this response. I dislike clothes shopping. I'm right there. I hate that too. I've been right between misses and plus size most of my adult life. And the inconsistency of la ladies clothes, clothing sizing makes it frustrating and difficult to know which department to even look at. Trends come and go. And they don't all work on every body type, of course. For example, when shorter tops are popular, I get annoyed because they warp my proportions and show my belly every time I move. Absolutely hated when low rise jeans went out of style. Not crazy low. I just prefer having pants resting on my hips instead of my natural waist. Having all those clothes makes me think I'm covered just in case my favorites wear out. But in reality, I know there's stuff in there I'll never use. And if you have clothes in your closet that you know you won't wear, then that's where you start to thin the herd. Why keep a short top style when it shows your stomach and it annoys you? <laughs> or covering you in case things wear out? How often does that happen? Once in a blue moon, do you wear something enough to wear it out? If something wears out, you can change to something else you already have in the closet or buy a replacement. There's an irrational fear here that one day you won't have enough clothes to wear. But of course, that isn't realistic or logical. So it's time to examine what you're afraid will happen if you give up some of the stuff. I doubt it means that you'll actually have to go naked into your day. You can probably find another solution. Cynthia has this to say, fear of needing the clothes for something and not having a choice of what to wear. Fear that I will get rid of something, then want it later. When there were less clothes in the closet, I felt the need to fill it up again. It was like an unconscious need to have it full. Since there was space, it needed to be used. So I'm going to talk about the space thing first. I see this a lot when I am decluttering somebody. And it, it doesn't matter whether it's the linen closet or a kitchen cat drawer or cabinet. Some people don't feel comfortable unless that storage space is stuffed and I clear it out with them and they, we keep the collections and we lay them out and then the drawer isn't full and there's air space which makes it easy to move things in and out like there's breathing room in there and you can put the dishes up and you don't have to fight to do it and you can put the things back into the drawer and it isn't hard to see what's in the cabinet because I mean in the drawer because there's not that much and people react to the negative space as if it's something bad. And I always have to coach people through, we want air in there. <laughs> it's the point, that's how you make it be more functional, <clears throat> is you make it have the ability to easily take things in and out. You don't have to unstack a bunch of stuff to get what you want. And having that air in between things is what makes it a 
usable space instead of a storage space. Stuffing it completely full changes it from functional use to storage. And in the kitchen where you're using the utensils in the closet where you're getting your clothes out in the bathroom where you want to be able to get your towels down, you don't want those spaces to be storage spaces. You want them to be use spaces. And so getting resting, I always end up saying to someone, sit with the negative space for a little while, sit with the air space for a little while before you start to randomly stuff it full. Use it with the air in between the items and see how much easier it is for you to function in there and try to wait <laughs> instead of panic and fill it back up. Wait with the space and see if you can get used to having it be that way instead. I'm not sure what, why the crowdedness makes people feel more comfortable. Some people are more comfortable when something is really, really stuffed. And I'm not sure that I understand what, how that's making you feel better. And maybe it's just familiarity. Part of it is like, it's been like that. It's been how the landscape has been all along. And so you get sort of get used to it that way. Um, if it's just a matter of this is what I'm used to and this is what seems normal, then maybe you can just agree to take some time with yourself to live with the lesser collection, live with the airspace inside something and see if you can get used to that being normal for you instead. Letting there be a gap, <laughs> letting the closet not be full and, um, and talk yourself into sitting with that long enough for it to feel normal and see if you can let go of that intense need to fill it back up. I, th I think too, there's a, you know, you, when you look at the very full closet at a glance, you feel like it represents lots of choices and, uh, you know, a, a, a blessing of options. And it, that feels, that feels like a good thing, but that's because you're not thinking about how much time you spend hunting and, how much time you spend ironing things that couldn't go in there neatly and hang, you know, remain neatly, uh, neatly pressed or wrinkle free. All the trade offs to mm -hmm. all the, tr all the downside to too much. Yeah. Great choice leads to overwhelm too. Like right. a lot of people, it, it's, it's just like going to the store. If the store has 150 options, you freak out and don't know which one to pick. <laughs> If, but if you have three options or five options, you can make a choice. Like the closet that is overstuffed and overwhelming gives you an illusion of choice while simultaneously shutting you down from being able to choose. And so it's not really, it's a false sense of abundance and option. If you can't get to them, then you don't actually have a lot. And if you can get to them, but you can't decide on something because it's so overwhelming again it's a false it's a false belief of options if you can't actually make a choice amongst them then you don't really have the options you just have a bunch of stuff i want to share a comment from amanda who's who's with us in zoom um and before i do i'll preface it by saying i thought it was interesting quite a few people who said i don't like to shop you know we've always talked before about how liking to shop leads to too much too much stuff mm. and but conversely not liking to shop seems to be a real problem for a lot of people and it's why they how, how they justify hanging on amanda said i'm the paranoid closet stuffer the things i don't wear are the right cut for me but there's something else about them that relegates them to being seldom used itchy fabric, poorly matched seams, etc. I have a tendency to buy what fits and run without thinking it through fully because shopping just isn't my favorite thing to do. It's an afterthought. My best shopping experience was meeting with a personal shopper at a department store. I thought that was really interesting. Because I'm sure that the personal shopper went beyond it's the right cut and looked for the seam is bad, the fabric is itchy. Like, she used all of those other criteria to help you make the choice and didn't stop at the first one. And so that helped you make better, more 
um, functional choices about what to keep. And buying something and running out, I totally get buying something and running out of the store, but I think it's important to recognize if you don't like to shop, then you need to go when you are in a good space, when you are rested, when you can stop and think about it. And to, and to think of it is, um, if I'm going to go, if I'm going to actually, I have a need and I need to go to the store, then I need to go prepared. It's like, it's like going to the grocery store with a list. You need to go with an idea of what you're trying to get and you want to make sure that your purchases make sense. And if you put a bunch of things in the basket or you take a bunch of things to the dressing room and you get to the end of trying them all on and you're exhausted, you don't want to just grab and go. You want to stop there and go, okay, so I put these, you know, 10 things aside as maybes. Now let me think my way through them and give yourself 15 minutes with your possibilities to evaluate them again for okay so I like this one but not as much as that one this one I'm not sure did it really fit that well oh I think this fabric is itchy oh I probably have some you know I already have something like this one and am I really wanting to replace it and take one out take the old one out and bring a new one in or can I just go with the old one I mean you can give yourself a, go when you're in good shape and good energy to go do the, do the stuff, to go look at the clothes. And then B, after you've tried things on and made your stack, pause and go through it again. It's just like being in Target and going through the shopping cart and go, do I really need all this stuff? Is this, you know, I've impulse thrown things into the shopping cart. And now before I go to check out, let me look at these things again and go, mm, no, I don't really need that. I don't really need that. You can always subtract before you go by and giving yourself the, the support by pausing and evaluating again. Okay. I picked this one because the cut works, but what else? If you put it on it's itchy, you know, it's just going to go, you're going to spend the money. You're going to take it home. You're going to hang it up. It's going to go into the closet. And every time you touch it, you're going to go mm, itchy and you're going to move on past it. So you're just buying yourself another problem to put in the closet spending the time to think through what you're buying before you take it home is a universal clutter management technique that works for all things that you buy from food to clothes. And in, the, in that closet, you don't want to be adding anything to the closet that just was a, you know, a spur of the minute. Oh, let's try that one. You don't need to do that anymore. <laughs> you're not 20. You can, pause and think about the clothes for a minute before you take them home. <clears throat> and I would add to that, um, shop with a budget in mind and don't be embarrassed if you get to the checkout and they finish ringing it up and that number looks too too big to you, say, I'm, I'm leaving that behind, take that off. That, you know, it's, it's their job. They're not going to judge you. They might judge you, but you know, it's still their job. And, uh, and you shouldn't, you know, don't spend more than you plan to spend. And don't take home an extra thing just because it's a good deal. Because yeah. your closet is full of good deals right now and you're <laughs> not wearing them and they're preventing you from getting dressed in the morning. So yeah, the, the fact that it was a good deal is just not a good enough reason to buy it anymore. Okay, we've talked a lot about the problem. So now let's talk about some strategies and solutions for corralling the clothes closet. And let's start by hearing a few responses from people who reported success in keeping closets under control. One respondent shared this approach. I only keep what I love and fit into. If I put something on and it doesn't feel or look right, it goes directly in the declutter pile. Also, I fold all out of the season clothes and then store them in my dresser. This way, the only things in sight are the clothes that I can wear right now. So she's the one that's, that's churning the contents of the closet for what's in season in the moment, what she can wear in, in the moment, which means that all of the winter clothes are not in the way of finding the summer clothes when it's summer and you're wearing them. So I think that's a good, like if she's trading them out from out of the closet into the dresser and back again, that means that she's a touching them all at the end of a season and, and 
you can evaluate them in that process and let go of things that, you know, they've now made it through another season and you're probably not going to wear them again the next season. And it means that you leave that much room for the clothes that you're actually getting in and out of every day. Um, Lenny offers this suggestion, one in and one out, to clutter at the end of each season. The main question is, did I wear this garment this season? And the main question to declutter in general, does this garment make me feel good? Oh my gosh, I think that is such a big, that's a question that we don't let ourselves ask very much in the closet. And I think it's so important. If putting on the garment doesn't make you feel good, then why on earth would you keep it? If it makes you feel bad in any way, it needs to live with someone else that it makes them feel good. If you don't feel good when you look at it and you don't feel comfortable when you have it on, then there is no reason to keep it in the closet because it's just mocking you at that point. And who needs to pay and house something that is mocking you? So I say out it goes if it makes you feel bad. And we, I think we forget to ask this question. Do I like how I look when I put this on? And if the answer is no, then it doesn't need to stay. Even if it's aspirational, even if it's, I want to get back into it again. Okay, fine. So pick three things that you want to get back into it again someday. And the rest of the things that you put on and it makes you feel uncomfortable, fat, ugly, misshapen, whatever it makes you feel that's bad out it goes it needs to go another viewer had this to say gradually over about five years i cleared out 75 percent of my clothes good for you life is much less complicated with fewer clothing choices i aim for comfortable versatile clothes that are suitable for a wide range of activities i'm following a one in one out guideline to keep the volume in check and i wish i'd done this decades ago I think that makes a huge, it's, it's such great sense. Even if you, I mean, if they're doing one in and one out, that means that they're not like setting a wardrobe at 30 pieces and they're going to wear those 30 pieces for 20 years. They're going to keep those clothes and wear them. And as they, if they want something new, they're going to take one out or replace it with something new and fresher. And it, so that you can keep the clothes, A, you can, buy occasionally you can keep the clothes up to date and current and you still don't have to have 400 million clothes right i knew somebody back in the day when i worked in offices it's been many years ago and she was a secretary and she spent um you know every uh, four seasons she would go and buy five office outfits things that she could wear to the office that were new and current and she would spend that money once a quarter when the new seasonal stuff com came out and she would wear those five outfits for three months. And, they, and that, so basically she was wearing the same five outfits, outfits every week for three months. And then the season would change and those clothes would go away and she would get five new outfits for the new season. And so basically she had new clothes every year. I mean, every season, and she would wear them all for three months. So, you know, she'd wear everything five or six times by the time all the weeks went by and then she'd be on to the next set. So her clothes were always current. They were always changing. They were always new. She wore what she spent, you know, she spent the money on it and then she got wear out of them and she didn't buy, you know, 5 million outfits. She bought five. And so it worked on her salary. It gave her, you know, she felt fresh. It felt current. She got to change all the time. And yet she had five outfits hanging in her closet. Like, I always thought that, that was so brilliant. Now, I'm sure she had other things in her closet, but this is how she managed her work wardrobe. And it, it was so amazing to me that that was what she did. And it was a marriage for her of, I only have this much money and I want to stay current and trendy in my clothes. And I want to be able to change and, you know, have new clothes all the time. And this was how she blended all those things because she didn't have an infinite budget. And it worked for her. The less clothes that you have, it may seem like you have less choice, but the less that that volume gets in the way, 
the more often you're actually making choices about what to wear instead of being completely overwhelmed and not able to choose at all. So I love this. I love that she got rid of 75% of it and that less, that lesser volume made her life work better. And that's something that we can aim for, right? Before we go on, I want to make an announcement, a special announcement. And who knew that just asking people to uh, go to Patreon and holding up that sign that we finally made after two years would have such a spectacular result because we actually have four new Patreon supporters this week. Yay. Very exciting. Thank so we you. want to say a very special thank you to Catherine, Dawn, Amy, and Susan for becoming our newest Patreon supporters. Thank you so much. If you would like to help support our efforts with a recurring monthly donation of any size, please visit cfhou.com slash patreon ah, there you go patreon. there's the sign in question which <laughs> apparently has already paid for itself so, you know it's just quite exciting right your contribution to help us offset the cost of producing the weekly webcast and podcast and will help us fund new projects that we have in the works thank you for your support susan amy dawn Catherine, and all of our generous underwriters we really, really appreciate it. And, you know, it helps me pay Ed's bill. So thank you so much. <laughs> and and Buzzsprout's bill and uh, right? Todd's YouTube's bill and Todd's bill. all the yeah. other bills. Right, right. Um, <laughs> I want to share a comment from Johanna or Yo Yo Johanna. Um, maybe some people are just used to clothes that are not right for them because they only got to wear hand-me-downs as kids. Mm -hmm. Now they think that's normal and they are not worth new clothes that suit them and make them feel good about themselves. Fair point. Very fair point. And if you haven't really thought yourself out of that corner, I think that that's a very valid point. If you are used to stuff not um, suiting you and not thinking about it too hard, then maybe it's an act of self-care that you can do for yourself to go in and say, yeah, that was the old me when I was a kid and I didn't have any control, but now I do have some control and I would like to have stuff that makes me feel good or that makes me look good or that I feel comfortable in and, and make the choice to have stuff that you like versus things that you're used to. It would be a kind thing to do for yourself. And um, I mean, it would be a project in a filter criteria uh, for somebody that is, as she described, uh, used to wearing things that don't really fit, that were just a hand-me-down. Put yourself first. I like the idea. Put yourself first and um, go through your closet and go, mm, yeah, all those things were hand-me-downs or all these things were a style that I got used to when my life was different and um, I can make a different and better choice for myself now and take care of myself better. I like it. Connie said, I think too many of us think people will notice that we are wearing the same clothes as a few years ago. Most people don't notice. And I actually, <laughs> I frequently have the thought, I didn't wear this last Tuesday, did I? Please say I didn't wear this last Tuesday. I, I have a very, <laughs> very small wardrobe. So if, if you think you're seeing repetition, that is you not an are. accident. <laughs> Well, and you know, I'm sure over our 220 whatever videos, I have worn this shirt more than once, right? Like, yes, somebody might notice that you've worn the shirt before, but if it's a shirt that makes you feel good and it's something that you like how, and it works for you, then I, you know, I think it's okay. Not all clothes work on everybody and not everybody cares enough to have a huge variety and, and wear the clothes and, and wear the clothes that you like and don't worry about it. <laughs> that's my advice and when you're bored with them you know let's one in one out let some things go bring some things in right okay so we got um clutter furry strategies here's some strategies for you although i think we've been we've sort of been circling around these all already yeah, we... unless the space in your primary clothes closet greatly exceeds your wardrobe you probably need to get everything out of there that isn't clothing so for instance, if you have your towels in the closet or you've got, um, you know, 14 pieces of luggage in the closet or you've got boxes of, you know, keepsakes from um, high school in there, anything that isn't about your clothes, your wardrobe, um, 
is probably taking up very valuable space in that closed closet. And that stuff probably needs to live somewhere else. I know we tend to fling things in the closet that we don't want to deal with or look at right in the moment. But when we fling those things into that closet, then they sort of go into the black hole and they never come out again. So I think it's important to go into the closet and see what is in there that is not about your clothes and look at how much space it's taking up that you could use and make, um, create some air around your clothes and to create some um, movement and flexibility with managing your clothes. And let's see if we can get those things out of there. It will make um, a big difference. Um, an exception may be for bedding, but even so I think um, if there's an alter alternative for the bedding linens, either in the room, like under the bed or in a different closet, sometimes linen closets are out and sort of in a central hallway, um, it's worth moving those things out so that you're not fighting with the clothes in the closet. Um, another strategy would be any category of clothing where you have large volumes can be ex examined to reduce the amount you're keeping. So if you think of a category like we, they had listed earlier, the kids clothes that the mom has a hard time letting go of, that's a category of clothing, the kids clothes. And um, the first thing I want you to ask yourself is how old are my kids? So you have kids clothes from when they were infants or when they were six or when they were 10 and your kids are now 50 or 40. Like you probably need to think your way out of that box because it is, it's memories for you, but the kids are going to be like, mom, what are you doing? Well, I do no, I don't want my clothes from when I was, no. And no, your grandkids aren't going to wear them and no, all of that, no. So other than they have fond memories for you because you remember the clothing when the kid was little and how precious and cute they were in the objects. Um, I think that that's a category of sentimental clothing that needs to take up a very, very small collection in your life. And it needs to not be stored in your, hanging in your closet. It needs to be treated like a keepsake and put in a keepsake box and put somewhere else. So um, another category of clothing, my shoes, my purses, my black pants, my pajamas, my fill in the blank, pick a category where you have large volumes and it's a way to tackle the closet in pieces, right? So if you know that you've got 150 pajamas in there, <laughs> you probably need to go in and pull all the pajamas out and try to reduce that collection some. This one is about money, so get ready. Whatever money you've spent on clothes that you don't wear is spent already. Saving in the closet doesn't change the fact that that money is gone. Keeping clothes you don't want but feel bad about spending the money is just creating a barrier to having your closet work. So you're punishing yourself either way. You've already wasted the money buying the clothes that you aren't wearing. So keeping them and blocking the use of the closet doesn't erase that fact. It's a false premise that not giving the clothes away means that you don't waste the money because you did and you have. <laughs> and now you're just making your life miserable because you're keeping too many clothes in the closet. So we shop for fun. We impulse buy. We go overboard. We get uh, lured by sales, we get excited about variety, and we spend money that we shouldn't spend on clothes that we're not going to wear. And it's, you know, we've entertained ourselves and wasted the money. And keeping the clothes in the closet to convince yourself that you're not, you haven't wasted the money, you're just lying. You're just lying to yourself. <laughs> I'm just saying it straight up. And you are missing or delaying the opportunity to make your money well spent on a donation to someone who can use that thing right if you just donated away and think i spent that money so that someone else can have some a nice um shirt practically new <laughs> practically new never been worn brand new thing that they can't they wouldn't have been able to afford otherwise um if you have money to throw around on clothes and clothes that you can't or don't wear then you have money to donate 
And so you might as well think of it as a donation and send it on. That's my point about the money. <laughs> the money is already out of your bank account. There's nothing you can do about that now. So it's time to send it on and not have it be choking up your closet just to prevent you from the truth that you've already spent the money. Actually, oh. before we get to the last thing on our list, I want to share one more comment because it's it's really um, it, it touches on an issue we've talked about a little bit. Okay. And it, it really affects a lot of people. Marcy says, when I lost some weight last year, I went crazy on Black Friday online with amazing sales and bought myself new things for next to nothing so that I could feel better about myself. It is keeping me more aware and giving me more of a reason to not gain it back. Oh, good point. And, and then she followed up with, I have an issue from when I was younger and had to wear the same things over and over because I was told that I had to get a new wardrobe when slash if I lost weight. So now I want a lot. I am getting over that kind of as I get older, but it is hard. Sure. And if you have lost the weight and you're maintaining it, I'm sure that you look great in all kinds of things. And there's still going to be colors that don't look good on you and cuts and, dis and shape styles that don't work for your figure and like nobody looks perfect in everything except for you know maybe a couple of models <laughs> but you know they don't have a closet problem that's not the, that's not our target audience here the average person is it has a style and colors that suit them and things that don't suit them and it doesn't and which isn't a function of weight so if you are managing to if you've managed to lose weight and maintain it then buying stuff that works for you is great. And you can, um, you know, you can also do the one in one out thing. Like if you are maintaining your weight and you want to have new stuff, you wear something for a season or two seasons, and then you send that on to somebody else to wear and you buy a new one to replace it. Like you can update your wardrobe um, with attrition just by replacing things. But the replacement part needs to include donating one away before as you bring one in so if you buy a new black pant that you like better you can let go of an old black pant and let it go on to somebody else you can still do that and have fresh options to have variety and not be stuck with i don't um, i don't have as much choice as i want to have just think of your choices as rolling choices right like you choose from this tin and Next year, you choose from an overlap that's half five of last year and five new. And the next year, it's again. And so it's it's constantly a rolling choice lot that um, you choose from. And in the meantime, the ones that you've gently used for a little while can move on and be supporting someone else. OK, so are we ready for the shoe questions? Yes, let's talk about the shoe questions. OK, so just for fun, we asked our viewers and listeners to tell us how many pairs of shoes you have and how many pairs of shoes you've worn in the last year. The most telling response was that 10% of respondents reported owning 51 pairs of shoes or more, but 0% reported wearing that many, <laughs> zero. Only 8% said that they th th worn 21 to 50 pairs of shoes in the last year. And a remarkable 65% said that they managed with 10 or fewer pairs. So we didn't design our survey to produce hard numbers on shoe use, <laughs> but a scan of the response uh, indicates that most of you own two or three times as many shoes as they've worn in the last year. And therein lies the <laughs> shoe problem in your closet. <laughs> there is, you know, if you have three times as many shoes as you actually wear, that means that you are having to store two times, you know, shoes in and like what shoes take up room and they're, they're big and they, you put them in boxes and you do all these things to try to corral them. You can't line up 200 pairs of shoes on the, on the floor in the closet. It's annoying. And so and managing shoes. <laughs> oh God. I mean, I know there, I know there are women out there who just, they love and collect shoes and it makes them so happy. And they spend a huge amount of money on them and it's like their designer thing to collect. I get it. And there'll be some point in your life where you're like, okay, I have these 200 pair of shoes and I can't possibly wear them because I've broken my ankle because I have gained weight because I am 
you know, I'm fall prone because I have, you know, la, 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 la. I have back problems now. <laughs> There's a million reasons why you don't need to in a pair of shoes. And if you collect them for fun and, and it's really a collection that you don't actually wear, then, you know, you can think about uh, maybe it's really not a, a collection of shoes that I wear. Maybe it's just a collection of um, cute stuff that I like to look at. And so maybe you want to make a display out of it or something. I, you know, I, the fascination of shoes is beyond me. I don't understand it. And I know people that live and die by the number of shoes that they have and how much they love them. And I get it. Like it's a collection, like my beads are a collection. Totally get it. And it is a management problem to, to house any collection in a closet. And so, yeah, if you're not wearing them, you may want to think about sending them on. If you love them, maybe you want to take a picture of them and you want to have a picture collection of shoes instead of the actual collection of shoes. So Gail, <laughs> <The> theory. <laughs> what? Pat, put, Pat put us on the spot ah. by asking how many pairs of shoes we have, including slippers. And my answer oh, is, man. Okay, let me count I think head. about six. I have more than that. There's they're the they're the Crocs, which replaced flip flops because Crocs are much easier on your feet if you have plantar fasciitis. Yes. The current running shoes, the backup running shoes for if I get rained on and can't wear the same pair of shoes two days in a row. The nicer running shoes that I wear to like family functions where I want to still be casual. One good pair, one pair of dress shoes, a pair of slippers, and I think that's about it. Okay, so you totally win the prize and, you know, you have a guy shoe collection. I do. It's true. Um, I have three, three tennis shoes that I rotate with during the week um, because I always wear shoes with insur inserts while I work. I have um, like four pairs of uh, sandals that have a, a supportive um, bases in them so that they're comfortable to walk on. And I probably have, I would say, somewhere between 25 and 30 other pairs of dress shoes, casual shoes, slippers, la, 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 yada, yada. And as I'm having this conversation, you know, I'm pretty sure I could go in and take out <laughs> three or four pairs right now and, and donate them on. Absolutely. Yeah, okay, I, was, we, I was never the person with all the shoes. <laughs> we are running way over time. Oh, we are. So okay, yeah, yeah. Let me get make a quick announcement about next week we'll be back next week tuesday august 2nd at the usual time noon u.s central working from home created unique clutter challenges even before the pandemic but now between sharing home workspaces with spouses and housemates zoom studios kids classrooms the rooms and spaces we dedicate to professional work are under more stress than ever. In our next episode, we'll talk about sources of and solutions for home office clutter. Join us on August 2nd for Balancing Work, Life, and So Much More, Clutter in the Home Office. And we're going to get to talk about paper again, I'm sure. Everyone's I'm so. favorite. <laughs> okay, time for the weekly tittle. Yes, please. Come out of the closet. <laughs> this week's assignment is to focus on and reduce one category of clothes from the closet clutter. So start by identifying a category of clothing of which you know or suspect you have too much. If you're in the 10% of our survey respondents with 51 or more pairs of shoes, you might want to start there. <laughs> Gather all the items in the selected category from everywhere that you have them stashed. The main closet, the overflow closets, the spare bedroom, the dresser drawers, under the bed, et cetera. So whatever that category that you pick is, go find all of the pieces everywhere. Decide on a set of criteria for which you'll keep or alternately for which you'll, for, for items that you'll discard or donate. For example, does it fit? Or on my current regimen, will it fit again within a reasonable amount of time? Do I still like it? Do I ever wear it? If the answer is no to either of those questions, then reflect on why you don't like it or wear it. Is it still good enough? Is it in still good enough condition to wear? 
doesn't have stains, doesn't have rips, doesn't have missing buttons, um, hasn't uh, worn thin or shredded somewhere, you want to know if it's good enough to actually wear out of the house. <laughs> Do I have similar items that I like better and prefer to wear? So sure, it's another pair of black pants, but if it's not your favorite pair of black pants or you know the top three, then maybe you have item, black pants that you like better and this one can go. Do I have multiple functionally identical items? How many do I need to maintain my typical wardrobe rotation? I'm pretty sure you don't need 15 pairs of pants that are black, that are dress up, whatever work worthy. You can probably get by with five or four. Evaluate the space available and establish at least a rough target for the number of items you plan to keep. So if you want that this, um, all of the shoes need to fit in this closet on this part of the floor or in this shoe rack or on, on this part of the shelf in the closet, then you know that this is your target storage area of where things are gonna go. And that gives you um, a rough idea of how much you can keep. Assess each item according to the criteria you've established and make your keep toss decisions. And that toss can be donation if you prefer, or some of them you may want to toss actually. If your keep pile still exceeds the total number of items you decided to keep, make additional passes through the keep pile to reduce it even further. The first pass makes the easy decisions. The second pass is going to make the harder decisions, but it can still be done and you can still reduce the volume. Hopefully this will be an exercise that you can do for one category. So we're not trying to assign you the whole closet or all clothes that you own. I know that's uh, too big in one sitting, but you can pick a category and try to get the category managed. And hopefully setting that category, doing this process for one category will give you an experience of how you can get through the rest of the closet one category at a time. And good luck with it. All right. I, we did not mean to have so much content this week that we didn't get to any contributions from the people who are with us live, but stick Sorry. around for a few minutes after we stop the recording. And uh, that's one of the benefits of joining us live. If you're watching this on YouTube, we'd love for you to join us live. To get notifications about upcoming events, we invite you to join the meetup group by visiting cfhou.com slash meetup. You can also follow us on Facebook by visiting cfhou.com slash Facebook or subscribe to our mailing list by visiting cfhou.com slash subscribe. We had a question today that I didn't get to answer about the surveys and the surveys are going out to everyone who is a member of the meetup group or who is on our mailing list to receive general announcements from us. Which is um, probably a combined like 4,000 people. It's I, I I don't know how much overlap there is. It's oh, it's more than true. it's more than five thousand people looking at the list separately. But there's I'm sure there's some overlap. Yeah, we love to hear from you. So please keep your questions, comments, and topic suggestions coming on YouTube, Facebook, or anywhere else that you find us. You can always reach us through our website at clutterfairhouston.com. Thanks everybody for coming. Thanks again to our new Patreon supporters. We had fun talking about closets today <laughs> and we will see you next week. Bye. Bye-bye.